Hello, you're now listening to the Modem Podcast, where we deconstruct, examine, and discuss deeply technical data networking and information technology topics. Sit back and relax while we fire up Dial D and the 9600 VOD Modem and connect to the Wildcat BBS. All right, welcome to season one, episode two of the Modulate Demodulate podcast, where we go deep into the technical details and trim through the underbrush of all of the dirty little corners of networking and IT that uh, often get overlooked. And today we have Don Sharp, who is going to enlighten us on the magical ways of free range routing or FRR as folks refer to it. And with me to keep me on track because I tend to ramble is David G and Chris Young. And without further ado, Don, you want to give us a pre a brief uh, synopsis of what uh, FRR is? Sure. So FRR is a open source route in, a complete route and stack for uh, running um, routing on a Unix type platforms. Um, it has everything you could possibly want in it. It's got BGP, OSPF, is, is, um, PIM, static routes. I'm sure I'm missing other stuff, but there's it, everything that you would expect an, uh, a routing stack to have, we have. It's got RIP. RIP, yes. RIP v2 as well. OSPF v3. <laughs> RIP ng uh, as well, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. Policy-based routing. Um, it's just a little everything, right? And where okay. we don't have, we're filling in the holes as fast as we can. Okay, so this is this is basically a, a fully comprehensive networking stack that will run on any number of different platforms, right? You can compile it yourself. Uh, you can run it as a standalone Unix processes. It'll run on uh, hardware that runs Cumulus Linux. And I guarantee you that like sort of the code base that it uh, originally emerged from, it's probably being integrated into all kinds of things behind the scenes to handle those difficult routing tasks that, you know, you either have to buy a commercial stack for or you, or you end up using something like this. Um, yeah, what I'm actually, actually, go ahead. Yeah, it actually runs on more than just Cumulus Linux. I mean, even though I do work at Cumulus or at NVIDIA, but, you know, we should call out like the players like, um, Six Wind, they run it. There's a uh, 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 VMware runs it. Um, uh, Volta runs it. It's on Danos. It's on Dent. It's on Sonic. So anywhere that you ex you are using routing today is being used. Okay, so it's it's pretty well traveled, I guess is is what we can what we can just uh, agree yeah. on here. It's a well traveled routing stack that you know, it, it, given a, a, a user's you know, travels on the internet, it's an almost guarantee that you're passing through something that's routed with FR at some point. Yeah. Um, so, you know, a, lo a lot of, a lot of talk around this kind of thing centers around data centers and, you know, BGP at the, you know, at the host and things like that. I want to, I want to take a different approach here. I want to look at some of the more, um, or, or I guess less well-known protocols and some of the features that um, are often hand-waved over because I know that FRR has uh, a, a really very comprehensive and, and complete feature set. So a, a couple of the ones that I'm uh, a little more familiar with that, that uh, I think you can speak to um, are um, like a BMP and uh, some of the flow spec pieces uh, I'm going to probably center a lot around BGP because that's where um, I live most of the time. But I also want to uh, sort of dive into some of the segment routing pieces. But if can you can you give us a, a, an update on 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 what is available as far as like the uh, and explain maybe a little bit what BMP is and and what can what what uh, FR can do with it. So BMP is a I don't remember the RFC number, but basically it allows. Uh, people to monitor their BGP updates from the, their peers remotely. And so basically when you, if I'm a router and I'm running BGP and I receive a route, I will, I can set it up so that BMP passes that route to uh, a remote 
server to collect data about that route. Um, BMP support came into FRR in version 7.2. It's only been about a year now. Um, we know people are using it because the bug, this, you know, we get a few bug reports and fixes are trickling in from people that didn't contribute the code originally. Cool. So, I mean, I think, you know, from an operational perspective, the way I've seen things like this done in the past, the way I've done it in the past is, you know, you have your monitoring platform and it's polling SNMP because that's what's yeah. typically the back end of most of those. And you might want to do things like get your um, uh, uh, routes received, right? You might want to record your routes received. So, you you know, if you're a service provider or if you're you know an exchange or even a large enterprise and you're receiving you know, bilateral peers. So like not the full table, correct connected routes from maybe one provider and, you know, full table from somebody else. You want to measure that, right? You want to see how that changes over time. And if there's dramatic changes, you can say, well, you know, somebody has leaked the global table to me, right? Which is something that happens. You know, we've all done it. And, you know, it's good to be able to know when that happens. And if you don't happen to have any type of filtering in place, which I don't recommend, you know, you need somewhere to be able to see that stuff. But this kind of takes it one step further than that, right? This is, I'm going to use a buzzword here and you're going to hate it. This is almost like a telemetry, like a streaming interface to the BGP updates. Is that? That's, that's exactly what it is. It's a stream and update of a stream, a stream of updates about what you are receiving in real time. Sent okay. over so you can collect it and do data gathering. And th I think the real goal of it is is that is that you can do your data gathering and processing off box on a machine that's more more relevant for handling that kind of load. And and the other thing that was interesting there, you you spoke about um, uh, BGP. Uh, oh, I forget my point. <laughs> <laughs> that's all good. So I speak about BGP a lot. A couple of questions there, and you're, it's funny, you were saying more relevant. I'm like, no, it's a box that's got the CPU and memory to be able to store it from a from a long-term historical basis. So you can figure out who leaked you the route that, that uh, what, what was the Cloudflare one where the telco, um, local okay. telco leaked them like a default route, something like that, and the whole internet went down? <laughs> Oops. Oops. Yeah. Right. Um, so we can we can historically do like a, a uh, I don't know if it's a forensic analysis, but an analysis, a root cause analysis to figure out over time what happened. So what is what format is that coming out in? And it, is there like a default decode if I want to just send that into a influx Prometheus, whatever, like what's the tool set? Kind of my my interest would be like is it a JSON R RPC kind of protobuf? It's it's a Telnet stream, not Telnet. It's a TCP stream of data. Um, the RFC states what the actual form, data packet looks like. Off the top of my head, I couldn't describe it. I didn't implement it. Um, but it's it's a well defined set of data that you receive in a stream of data over a TCP connection. And and the other, you know you you mentioned. Off, you know, we mentioned off box, and one of the things that is interesting about BMP, it was designed from a closed source perspective, in my perspective. And what I mean by that is that when I buy like a Cisco or a Juniper or a Huawei or or any major vendor, I don't have access to run whatever I want on that box, nor do I have access or control of the CPU or memory that really shows up on that box. With FR and that's different. If I decide to run uh, FRR on a top of the line AMD Ryzen, I can do that. If I want to throw 256 gigabytes of memory at it, I can do that. And it's it's just as easy as whatever box I happen to buy it for. True, true. So you can run this on again. It's a you know it's a it's a Unix process, right? So you can run it on really any platform that can run the the, the binaries. I want to I want to go back and and talk about some of the this brought up a a, a, um, a thought uh, when we talked about you know consuming that data and then mining that data. So in the past, there hasn't been a really good way to do what you just described, which is you know gather that data, collect it, and then um, do data mining on it. There, I mean, there are like you know so there's there's um, 
uh, what's the format that the BGP dump stuff is is uh, is kept in, right? But you're so essentially like route servers, like route views or whatever, which I believe is also a consumer of the BMP um, addition that you've added to this as as project. Um, you know, they consume the global tables, and you can get uh, you know, you can get uh, binaries or I'm, I'm sorry, text dumps of the global table. So you can go through and see what the snapshot of the DFC, or the default free zone of the internet looks like at any given time, right? But that's very heavyweight. So you can sort of do that data mining, but it's, you know, there's no real, you have to write your own code and it's a little bit heavyweight rather than, you know, being able to consume it from your own perspective rather than the, the global table, right? And the only other way I've known to be able to do that, all, which is also looking at the DFC, is the um, was originally a, a, a project that came out of the Route Views project, but now is maintained by Ripe, um, which is the BGP Play, where you can go and you can sort of look at a snapshot in time, and it'll query for prefixes, and it'll tell you like when it changed and what it changed to. Um, but that's one location, right? And again, it's the whole DFC, so it can be a little bit cumbersome to use. With this, you know, any service provider or any exchange or any enterprise, any entity that's running it for that matter can do collection privately of the of, of the data that they want to see that's coming from their BGP speakers, and then do the and then do their in-house um, you know data mining on that themselves. And I think that's that's very empowering because for content providers and other other folks that you know need to be able to do optimization and troubleshooting you know the options were very limited now, not non-existent there's some commercial platforms that do this but um you know i think that having this available as an, one an open standard and two an open source project has enabled things that were previously very difficult to accomplish I think maybe we could reword that ever so slightly to um, instead of taking something like a BGP code you found from GitHub or from Bitbucket or whatever, and then adding code to extract the updates and basically hacking it together yourself, you've now got a protocol-based um, legitimate standard um, to be able to do that off the shelf instead of having to go and either hack together your own stuff, which is which is kind of nice. And even from um, from an automation point of view as well, being able to uh, have rules and pinpoint specific updates. I think is really quite powerful. So, you know, if you're a service provider, you want to see if something's disappeared or something um, appears maybe and then trigger rules from there to, you know, reconcile, um, you know, against actions. It's really, really powerful. Um, it's, I mean, yeah. I'm not, not going to mention any of the kind of commercial platforms here, but yeah, experience with this, this is um, almost game changing. Sorry, it's a terrible cliche uh, phrase, um, but from well, an operations and engineering I'll point of view. Out a commercial platform, like this sounds like Arista's uh, SysDB NetDB. Right, um, HPE with the CX platforms had something similar as well. Difference, the main core difference here being that this is something freely available, open source. You can look at the code, right? And it is, um, in theory, if other vendors start to choose to 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 uh, develop it, it starts to become interoperable, right? I think um, what I have seen over the last ten years of watching this, God, is it ten years already? Open source networking started to becoming a thing and the last last uh, more than a decade ago um yep <laughs> vendors the 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 uh, kind of tier you know one two three manufacturer selling you tin um hardened architectures tend to uh to to kind of give this you know lip service to open source whereas i have seen other vendors you know cumulus and again i'll call out cumulus being one of the main ones here have done a phenomenal job of creating these integrated stacks of like from from what I would see from a cumulus working with open source through people like you Donald and, and and other people that we will end up seeing not just the the BMP agent but also you're you're going to start seeing open source blogs of BMP agent this is integrated into these particular monitoring stacks like this with a, a Grafana whatever the the new visualization of the du jour is on the front end right and we're like you will be able to, to your point, I think, David, get a um, full off the box, uh, off the shelf solution that ties all this stuff all together without having to cobble it together yourself. It is you interesting. Could. I mean, <clears throat> just to kind of intercept 
on that one as well. And so last year I was working on a project where um, customer wanted to see um, routing, sorry, <coughs> routing updates um, coming in almost in real time and then having them um, be placed onto a graph database. And then the, what they wanted to do is have real time kind of queries running to make sure from, you know, from A to B um, kind of layer three reachability was there. And um, okay. So, you know, some of the commercially available route uh, kind of network operating systems have um, BMP, but um, being able to do this from from FRR. And I don't know, it, it's just, I think the last two or three years we've seen telemetry emerge from a control plane and, and data plane point of view. And then you look at this from, from a protocol perspective, it just opens up so many um, capabilities around assured or a network assurance and being able to kind of you know plan and, and reconcile things as well it's um or reconcile against desired state it's just really powerful instead of going back to the days where we had to hack together some awful code or do like um i've even done this in the past um basically create a tcp shim to intercept and then spit out the things that you're interested in and then passively you know or transparently forward everything else on which is uh yeah days of old headaches this is this is really good stuff can i just be a, like an old stickler here so um i played with quagga and zebra a long time ago um and frr is something i've got to kind of put my hands up i've not not really done a whole lot with so um for people coming across this for the first time ago and frr i've heard of it but tell me the difference between zebra quagga and, and the kind of origins can you you know is it um, a derivative of is it replacement um you know how, how does it how does it look from the origins story side of things so five years ago i was you know so i joined uh cumulus in 2015 i've been here so six years i'm sorry december of 2014 six years ago and we were using quagga and um at the at that time, when I joined the company, Cumulus was carrying two or three hundred patches on top of Quagga that we couldn't get upstream. We were having a real wow. hard time getting stuff upstream. And and then over the next year, we I, I say we the not not just Cumulus but the community spent a lot of time talking about how we can improve the. Quagga development process, and we couldn't come to an agreement. So, so we forked, and um, that was in 2015 or 2016. I don't, I don't, I'm not good at dates. So, so five years ago now, we forked, and um, and basically, when you do a fork, you you take the code, plop it aside, and go. We're starting to work over here, and and start and start accepting patches. And we went to GitHub. And use GitHub because it has a very modern um, uh, process for for doing development. Um, it's like I can submit a pull request, and uh, someone else can review it and hit a button and merge it in. That that's the kind of things that we wanted to be able to do. And uh, so 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 FR is Quagga has it as a roots, but it's not the same quagga anymore. You, you, the code bases have diverged fairly significantly. We probably, we're doing three or 4,000 commits a year. Okay, wow. And, and uh, so the last uh, release of FRR was 7.5, that was in October. And there was 1,000 commits from 70 different people. Okay, so that then leads me to the next question. Then, so this then uh, FRR really is the kind of control plane aspect. Um, so if if one wanted to do say tunneling with um, kind of FRR, how would that look? And obviously, I've got millions of questions then around like uh, integration with uh, XDP and you know eBPF and all these kind of things. Um, so yeah, so how do, how does this look from a component level? Is this kind of control plane only with that you know kind of help and assistance with regards to integration to data plane? No, so let's, let's take a step back and, and talk a little bit about because what you're talking about is the the merger, the marriage, the marriage of the control plane plus the data plane, right? Yep. And um, so so FRR mainly works on Linux, and the reason that is, uh, and I, it, all features work on Linux. If you want to go to something like a BSD, great, but you're not going to have as many features. It's more plane route and you're going to get you'll be able to do bgp you'll be able to do you won't be able to do mpls you won't be able to do pim and a bunch of other stuff right so so or you won't be able to do evpn either but so so the the fr a lot of times has to go hand in hand with data plane changes to make it work 
A great example recently is the EVPN multi-home and uh, bridge and changes that need to go into the Linux kernel. When I did PIM, I had to make some multi um, some uh, changes to the uh, the multicast code in the Linux kernel as well. Um, so there is work that has to be done. Someone has to care about it and, and spend the time development. No, so to your specific question about tunnels, so a tunnel shows up as an interface under Linux, right? Well, an interface is presented to, you know, the Linux kernel presents that interface as a interface. You can ask the Linux kernel, hey, tell me about all interfaces. When they happen, they'll show up or go away. Just tell me about it. So FR sees the change, it goes, oh, there's a new tunnel interface and it has this IP address. Okay, well, let's create a connected route for it in the, in the FR rib. And let's and let's tell everyone who's interested in knowing about it. So so there has to be a data plane control plane marriage that we spend a lot of time working and getting right. Sure. So do you provide helpers for those kind of interfaces with an FRR, or is the user expected to go create, say, the the kind of tunnel tunnel interface, and then obviously then through kind of netlink that's exposed up through then through FRR? Right now, we expect the the user to go do those separately i think in order to do that right someone has to take that on hmm. and I, I guess I, I let me preface that a little bit more getting code to auto create and handle interface creation is typically handled by like a couple like ip route to in the linux kernel or or you know there's someone's writing that code right and that is work that needs to be, uh, I don't want to necessarily create two different places. I can create a, a tunnel and have it work. So typically in the past, FR has been hands off on interface creation. I think that's going to change over the next couple of years because people do want the total integration. I want to be able to say, create me a tunnel from the VTY shell, the FR CLI, create a tunnel and have it show up but someone has to go in and program FR to write to send the netlink message or the, the 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 message to the kernel saying create this and it's 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 real work it's hard work from my, and it's grunt work as well it's not just it's not the sexy i'm writing a new protocol work and that's probably why it hasn't really shown up yet so uh, what i'm what i'm taking away from that is that don needs interns <laughs> But it's the unsexy side, isn't it, of this? It's, it's everybody wants ease of operation, but nobody wants to do the dull headache work to make it easy or pay for it, which is the other problem. But interns. Again, interns. <laughs> <laughs> which is why we still have SNMP. You know, you, you mentioned that, but, you know, we actually participated in the Google Summer of Code last year, and we had a guy show up, do work for us, and he wrote a whole bunch of Netlink. He changed our... Um, data plane code so that we can do netlink batching and send a lot of route requests down to the kernel in one in one go and that was like and that's a huge performance improvement and he just showed up and so you know interns are great and uh and the google summer of code is great um the problem you know with interns when 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 they work for my companies that i work for i i want to give the interns something that's interesting and not necessarily grunt work because yeah, yeah. It's, the, the, with that approach that you're setting the interns up for a really disappointing life you know if you set them off just on the path that they're going to grow from you know here's a terrible work and this is this is where you get yeah. to the next level no, you, no, no. This, this is a whole different <laughs> podcast but i'm just you're right leave, leave it with this that's called learning the fundamentals and the fundamentals aren't just technical they are also the fundamentals of life is you have to eat your vegetables before you get to dessert you might get a piece of chocolate to lead you on, but I digress. So that's actually a pretty good segue into the next thing I want to talk about. So we're, we're talking about the tunnels and, and I do, I do want to say that I agree that, you know, sort of those integration pieces are, you know, the, the fit and finish. Yeah. And that's probably not a great way to put it because, you know, but it's someone, exactly right. It's the, it's the, someone's coming in and putting the trim to hide the ugly baseboard. Right? <laughs> fair enough fair enough but i mean i mean th that's always the hardest part right that and the documentation um but you know given that we've been talking about tunnels and and uh, and how those are created and, and some of the protocol support 
I want to I want to switch gears and talk about uh, something that is of my own personal. It's one of my things I like, and I've been bothering you about this for a while, Don. You know what I'm going to say next is um, the segment routing support, specifically in ISIS, because I think for those that aren't familiar with FR, there's been um, segment routing support in OSPF for quite some time, um, but ISIS has sort of been working on it for a while, but I believe it's complete now. Yeah, it came in in uh, the 7.5 release back in October. Yeah. So and it, for, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was going to say for, for, for the listeners that, uh, you know, are maybe unfamiliar with the segment routing is sort of a, I don't want to call it a replacement, but it's a evolution of um, MPLS tunneling. Uh, so it, it essentially allows you to create segments uh, put and, and, and SR MPLS push labels down that dictate what those label switch paths will be. And you do it from the head end node. So from the first router, you push, you know, four labels, and those labels define the path of that particular set of traffic, right? And that's all carried as a TLV inside of your interior routing protocol. And in the case of what we're talking about here, ISIS. So in addition to carrying IPv4 routes, IPv6 routes, now there's the inclusion of, um, these LS, this LSP stack as well, which I think is a really big deal, especially for the service provider carrier space or anyone really that's large enough to need some reasonably complicated um, traffic engineering. Because until now, I don't believe there was an open source alternative to um, ISISSR. Um, yeah, so, I'm not aware of anyone else doing it on open source, in all honesty. I'm not actually yeah. really aware of an another open source is is implementation. I don't think there is one. I mean, the the one that was in Quagga, I had a fair bit of experience with, and it was definitely incomplete. You could you could get it to crash pretty easily by configuring it. I mean, it had configuration options for things like point to multi point, but. Yeah. It would it would crash the binary every time you tried to use it. And so it was there, but it was never complete. And so FR kind of took that and polished it up, made it production worthy. Um, because having run it in production, I can tell you that it was no fun to support um, it, prior to that. But then going one step further and adding that, that SR and PLS TLV into it, is uh, a very very big deal for you know the, the the traffic engineering needs that are out there. Um, can you can you talk about that a little bit? Maybe uh, maybe explain why uh, why in the past building ISIS or ISIS or whatever you want to call it is a little more difficult than maybe something like BGP. I, I wouldn't actually say it's building difficult. I think it was a, um, a focus of no company was using it, right? So the is it ISIS or is is I'm not, I always get confused with what you're supposed to call it. Whatever um, you want to call it, I don't it. think we call it ISIS anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you know, bugs get shaken out when people start using it. And, and some company supports it. So when, you know, two or three years ago, when Volta started using it, they, a bunch of patches came in to that fixed it from them, from the, from their perspective. And so, so that's what made it usable. And I also think uh, Volta was, is, is involved in the, in the segment route and support that. I know Volta is doing a lot of work with segment route and for both OSPF and is, is, and it's, it's an interesting, you know, it's it fits their cloud model, so that's why it's happening. I think that's the question: is why is it happening? Because some company cared enough to spend the development resources on on it and and make it solid and then extend it. Yeah, it's one of those protocols that, at least for me, I've always found superior for lots of different reasons that we don't have to talk about right now. From a supportability and management and scaling perspective. But it just only really existed in in the big carriers that needed the scale, for the most part, not not always, and and that's something that 
you know, I think is slowly changing, but like its absence in a lot of enterprise gear, I think is one of the reasons it never grew. And, you know, it doesn't even exist in some of the, you know, some of the more esoteric um, service provider platforms, like say Microtik, for example, right? Which has a very prolific install base um, and incredibly good protocol support from like the number of protocols it supports, MPLST, you know, RSVPTE, LDP, all those things exist in this very inexpensive platform, but it doesn't have ISIS. And I think there's a couple reasons, in my opinion, right? It, it, one, the biggest one is, you know, it wasn't the it wasn't the popular choice, right? It wasn't the taste of a new generation. There's a great podcast uh, that the Pack Pushers did years and years ago about you know sort of the history there. That's a great listen um, if if people are so inclined. But it's but it's also the fact that it's you know it's not relying on sort of the you have to learn a new protocol stack essentially because it's its own ether type. It's not IP. Um, and so that makes it sort of this weird stepchild over to the side that's different in its development strategy, right? Because it's not the same as the other bits and pieces that you're probably developing for. And I think that's one of the reasons I love it, but that's also probably one of the reasons why the development just didn't happen because it's a, it's a really specific not to go too far down the rabbit hole, but I think Donald nailed it. It's not used because it's not stable, but it's not stable because it's not used. And we can go around in circles. The last time in an enterprise standpoint that I remember talking about ISIS was Trill was in the same sentence. <laughs> yeah, huh? exactly. Right? Like yeah. that's, you know, in the whole, um, the the Trill wars of who's is actually brocades and or Cisco's because neither one was compliant. Right? Um, yeah, I, it, <laughs> the last time I used ISIS in an enterprise setting, um, I spent two days troubleshooting. I just couldn't see um, neighbors. Turned out the switch in the middle didn't forward the ether types. Oops. Yeah, Oops. I mean, it, it's yeah. one of those things, right? And, and you know, we ran it at the supercomputing center I worked at, but like, you know, we we weren't really an enterprise, right? We were a supercomputing center. And so we had a different sort of scale and, and, and needs and requirements. And we were also really early V6 adopters. Um, so, you know, having to support one routed protocol with multiple or two routed protocols inside one routing protocol was very, you know, with a small team was very uh, um, desirable for us. But, you know, I think that the, the ISIS support in this is, is a pretty big deal. And, you know, I think we've, we've probably could go a whole episode just on that, but, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to bogart the whole thing with, you know, my little pet <laughs> crushes. So, you know, let's, let's go ahead and, and, and talk about one of the other, um, and maybe two of the other nice features that have been added in the seven five release of FR. And t both of these, I think, are a pretty big deal. One of them is a little more niche than the other. So we'll talk about that one first because I think it'll be quick. But the fact that you're doing IPv6 flow spec is is very, very cool. Um, and for the listeners, uh, BGP flow spec is a, uh, what is it, RFC 5575. It's the, the NLRI that allows you to disseminate what is functionally firewall rules inside of BGP updates. Um, you can do up to a five tuple match. It's a very good technology for mitigating DDoSs uh, at a carrier scale or at a, you know, border edge where you don't use the sledgehammer of, you know, a black hole route where you can black hole like a source desk and a port and a protocol and that's it. Um, and having that ability over IPv6 as, you know, the IPv6 internet sort of ramps up at a fairly quick pace at this point, you know, faster than it ever has before, I think that's going to become increasingly important. Um, especially because a lot of black hole routing and DDoS mitigation systems are using open source routing on the back end to do pretty much all of the heavy lifting. So there's the, the good news is that we do have V6 flow spec support. The bad news is that we don't have data plane integration. And the reason we don't have, and so, so, so what I mean by that is 
we can receive and send the V6 NLRIs. We cannot install them into the kernel to provide the, the, the firewall, firewall on that you might want. So we're passed through only at this point in time. And the reason why we don't have it at this point in time is that we couldn't come to an agreement on how to do the data plane integration in a way that everyone agreed on. So we're still waiting for someone to come back to us with more, more work done there to, to finish it off. What we I think to first order, that's probably still okay, at least from the vantage point that I'm looking from, right? Where this, you know, this FR platform is generating the routes that are then pushed out to, you know, 50 routers on the WAN, right? All yeah. it needs to be able to do is understand the format and then speak Pass to the and send the yeah. updates. Um, of course, you know, obviously we want data plane support. So eventually I'm sure that'll come. You actually, we actually have discussed architecting it and handed it off to an intern because the, the, so, so the Linux kernel has this thing called TC traffic control that you could do the V6 or V4 flow spec rule insertion, but it's actually the interface that is really, really obtuse and hard to do. And in the original implementation that we got for flow spec had FRR uh, shelling out and running TC commands from the Linux command line. And, and we just said, no, you, we can't do that. And mainly because uh, the minute you start doing like running external shells, you start, you, it's security issues that I don't want to even have to, the CVEs that would come flowing are not what I want to be. I'm not interested in, in writing code that it's going to be a CVE factory. And that was the decision why we didn't allow that implementation. Yeah, I think it's also a support nightmare, right? Yeah, but that, so that's the other thing that's been interesting over the last year from a support perspective is that people are using FRR who don't understand routing itself. And so you get the questions of this isn't working, but it becomes evident that they don't understand routing. And FRR is working fine. You did it. It's doing exactly what you told it. But how do you... As an, an organization, I'm sure you've all run into this as well. It's like there, there are routing is complicated enough that sometimes it's hard to tell if you're running into a bug or you're being stupid. Right. And and from an open source perspective, we have a lot of people coming to us going, I'm using your thing and it doesn't work. And it's and it's and it can be really challenging to figure out how to help that person. And it, and then sometimes you're like, I I can't help this person because they don't even understand what I'm trying to tell. I mean, one on that, I'm um, I'm a prolific user these days of um, RetroOS so from Microtik. You know, I shouldn't really probably admit to that, you know, who working who I work for, but alas, it is what it is. And sometimes if you forget the the kind of forward slash, but the, the, the mask um, Datron, Microtik will accept it but then you end up forming like a weird black hole. So that's for interface addressing or, um, you know, kind of firewall rules or whatever. And, and it, it, will, it will accept an, uh, an IP address without a, a subnet mask. Obviously for, you know, for V4, but it, it, even, you know, 15 years in, you think, I know what I'm doing. And then you think, oh, I made a deep it'll, it'll do it for V6 too, uh, <laughs> by the way. It'll assume 64. <laughs> so... Um, that's a that's a very good point, and I think there's a great analogy there because um, anyone who's ever touched router OS and the and the MicroTik platform knows that it's got everything exposed. Mm -hmm. Like it exposes every nerd knob you can possibly imagine on a routing platform. And so, if you go and you look at say Amazon reviews of people buying these like for their Soho routers or whatever. 99% of the low ratings are because they have no clue how to do these things because it's not meant to be easy, right? It's meant to be functional. And, and I think that you hit the, the nail on the head there, Don, is that, you know, routing is obtuse enough that anybody that says that they haven't had the experience of, is this a bug or am I doing it wrong? I would say is either one, not telling the truth or I question how hard they're actually working. Right. Because we've all done that. Everybody's done that. And that's comes back around to the, it's a, you know, it's a difficult support situation, right? Because open source software is hard enough to support as it is. 
and add to that, you know, by the way, I'm going to go ahead and chain the cinder block to my foot before I go <laughs> swimming is, you know, that's, you don't How need to dare do your that, software, right? not, not stop me from tying the cinder block to my foot. <laughs> yes. Oh, and, and how dare and, it not read my mind properly? You're a terrible well, software developer. Yeah. And the, the, the amount of things, not to digress even further, but there was a, a great Twitter thread where somebody wrote his own um, IP address parser over the holidays. I don't know if you guys saw this. I, but... I saw parts of that, but it was I the deep. So. Oh, I went it right down to the bottom. I, <laughs> I dove to the bottom, and it was awesome because it's things that um, some of us have probably encountered, but an IP address can be represented in decimal. Mm -hmm. And you can ping a decimal address if you convert your your four octets into back into whatever the number would be in binary and convert it back into decimal, which means you can also do it in hexadecimal, which means you could also do it in octal. So you get all into these like esoteric weird should it support it or shouldn't it? And and um he had gone through a list of different Unix variants all the way back in time to well, how did the original BSD or or whatever in 1982, how did that do it? And and what of those? So and I guess to bring it back to the conversation, how do you then account for for people having to not not have that 35 years, 40 years of history, 50, 40, 45? God, we're old. Um, yeah, it, it's tough, right? And and honestly, it's back to ISIS. It's the same thing. You know, how many people in um midway through their careers are not have never taught touched a non-ip protocol atm right so um on the, sorry i'm going to digress again on the phone ATM, to us, that will talk ipx spx uh ethernet snap maybe that was your problem your switch was was configured for ethernet snap you didn't oh, flip it, it over it I went through the whole list. None of it worked. Um, so going back to, to FRR, so I'll, I'll ignore the support thing. Nobody needs to know what, I, what, what hellish conversation I had over the holidays. But um, if somebody wants to get involved with uh, the, say, insertion of flow spec data into the kernel, is this something that you will talk to other people and organizations openly about? Or is this like closed work going on right now within within your team? So from from a... From a personal development perspective, I work for NVIDIA, and NVIDIA is focused on data center right now. Mm -hmm. So, so V6 flow spec, not high on that priority, right? Okay. Um, from a open source, running the community, if you come to me and say, hey, I'm interested in doing this, I'd be like, sounds awesome. Here are some things we've thought about and are concerned about. So you're right, which is awesome. Yeah. So, so my my one of my things i must do is i must be inclusive and i must allow people to come and ask questions and um and and help participate and i must do things to to allow people to participate because if i don't do that this whole thing's just going to fall apart right you, you it's oh it, it's it's open source in the fact that anyone can participate and everyone has valid ideas. Not, I guess I shouldn't say everyone has valid ideas. People can do things in, in ways that may not be right, but if they're willing to listen to you and come talk to you about the solution bef before they've implemented, that's awesome, right? Because then I can get more people developing on it and I get broader support and I get the bugs fixed. And I can't tell you the number of times that a, that a, upstream version of the code has fixed something that our customers found and I just go slap the patch down internally and then I'm done. So it's 15 minutes worth of work versus the sometimes days or weeks of unraveling a, a bug in the code, right? Cool, excellent. Yeah, Sorry. so I, I, like the, I like the open source community that's you know that surrounds fr and i've always found everyone that has been involved in it to be very approachable which is not always the case you know with with open source projects um it's it's actually often not the case with open source projects so how can that i don't understand how those projects can be successful but that's just me right I, and then maybe that's yeah. just the way i think about the problem but if 
if if I'm not allowing people to work with me, I'm not getting their expertise for free. I think to be fair to that, um, a lot of people get excited about going to uh, contribute code and be recognized. Um, but instead of coming forward and saying, right, um, what ideas are in existence today about solving problem X? And can I work on one of those? Or I've got some more ideas. Has anybody thought about it this way? I've seen this a million times, and I've even been guilty of this in the past, where I've stayed up all night and coded some stuff together and went to contribute and said, I've solved the problem. And then somebody said, well, we don't want it solving that way. Well, I didn't know that. Yeah, but you didn't ask a question. I mean, ah. And this is why I asked the question very targeted earlier on. You know, if somebody wants to get involved, what's the right way? So we can probably break that down. Come and have sure. a chat. Come and sure. what are the thoughts? And let's let's come to a conclusion in terms of the direction and be those advocates for the community instead of you know you know uh, you see this all the time on twitter oh you know how how ungrateful they are i spent two days of my life working on something that nobody wants this is not very inclusive yeah but they didn't do anything that was in the community guidelines either and i think this is one of the one of the things i'd love to eradicate for 2021 is this attitude of you know just because you have a machine and you're on the internet doesn't mean you're entitled for all of your ideas to be accepted i'm too old and grumpy for this crap now um it would be awesome if people actually just talked, just talk. How do we do these things together? Let's let's yeah. do it. So, how do you talk to us? Um, we have a we have a Slack channel you can join, and the go to the frrouten.org website and click on the Slack icon, and you can auto join us. We have a development alias, and uh, you can also tweet at me if you want. That's um, awesome. But but the the and we and I I should really say we have a weekly uh, technical meeting where we discuss where we're going as a community, and you know you know. Um, Jeff, you have the uh, the telco as a focus. We have a, a biweekly telco meeting that is this is we're talking about telco issues and how we can fix them. And um, anyone who wants to come and join those meetings, just let me know. We'll let you come, and you can come. You can you can be a fly on the wall and listen. Anyone can come and participate. What technical skills in terms of programming languages um, do people need if they want to come and participate technically? C. C. Okay. Yeah. Is we that do it. Version of C, some ANSI, you know, K and R C. Markdown uh, documentation. Just, so we can talk about that. The documentation in a second. So it's just uh, standard C. The whatever the current standard is. I don't. I'm not a C. I am a C guy, but I'm not that local of a C guy. Um, I'm not in GCCC. Yeah. So if you're using GCC or Clang or anything like that, it works great. Um, from a documentation perspective, we require any new feature to have documentation as part of the commit. You cannot commit a new feature or a change in the doc in the change in the CLI without a corresponding change in documentation as well. And the so not And wait, the second wait, let's say that again and and hope that people will learn from this. Now I'm I'm calling the kettle black here because I hate writing documentation, but you're saying that if you want to contribute, that you're you're going to contribute everything, right? And so, and I think this yeah. is, a, this is a, a very key element to why this project has been as successful as it is, is because the requirement of documenting what your change is, is, a, is a, like I said, it's a requirement. Right, so that somebody can go and understand what you did, rather than here's a patch that does this thing in this way that I know how to do that might be, you know, not optimal or whatever. And it also, I didn't document how to use it. Yeah, we're actually there's two different types of documentation that we must have. There's the user face and support doc. How do I use this feature? That must be written. End of end of story. If I if I see any new CLI that comes in and it doesn't have a doc change, I immediately Put a knack on the the PR, ain't going in until it's fixed. And the second the second aspect is a documentation of the commit itself and 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 writing up of the thought process of what went into the actual change itself, and that becomes part of the commit message for the commit from through the Git repository. And I actually spend part of what I do is I go look at those and go, can I in the future read this? documentation and understand the thought process of why this change was made. And if I can't answer that question, I go ask for them to change their commit messages as well. And there's a third thing that we actually also require now too, that if you're submitted in a new feature, you must have a test that shows that that feature works submitted as well. So mm -hmm. you have those, 
those basically the documentation and testing for any new feature that comes in. If it's a bug fix, we don't need a we don't need to test the feature necessarily. But it might be nice to write a test so that we know that that bug fix stays working. For tests, um, just just for clarification here, you want about um, tests at the kind of integration and operational level. So if somebody wants to stand up the uh, FRR platform and use a feature, or are you talking about tests as in unit tests? Well, let's take the is a segment route and support that just came in in seven five, right? They the person who submitted it wrote test that brought up is is across multiple nodes configured segment route and made sure that it was working and, and data was being transferred and, and PLS, the, the routes with labels were being installed in the current. We have that test now. And so if someone comes and makes a change, we hopefully will know that, that they didn't break a fundamental feature of FR now. And, it's, and so, so as part of all pull requests now, you the, the the our ci system runs those topology tests and if it fails the the, the pr is not going in and it's on the um, person who submitted the pr to go in and fix those tests either by a test modification or fix their code yeah that's cool i mean testing itself could probably consume another another hour on this um, but <laughs> interesting when you get to like combinatorial testing and the deviations that come up from the smallest of all yeah, right. that's, that's a whole day. <laughs> yeah, we can do that. No, but what I love, what I'm hearing on this is, if I am a again a new to mid year mid career networking engineer, and I want to get more into the development side, um, what I have heard right now is that it is an incredibly inclusive environment, but not just inclusive. There are expectations put on you, so it's not just you're included. Welcome, here's your participation trophy. It's no, you, we'll include you as long as you do the job. And by the way, the job is good hygiene, right? It's, it is the, what the hell was I thinking when I did this test? Because I can tell everybody on here has failed that test multiple times, right? And you look back at things and go, like, you know, your, your maturity, your thought level, your use cases, your priorities all change over time. So understanding what those were like, that's awesome. Having tests, having documentation. Like I, I would, uh, if I had more time in my life, I would love to participate more. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, you know, leave it, leave it to the young kids, the interns. But let the uh, interns do it. Yeah, let let the interns do it. But it's, I, I love the fact that you've set a, an environment that has both expectations and inclusiveness as its, as the bar. If so, we, if we didn't have that, it would just the project would devolve into a broken state. And I don't know, because it, it, it's, routing is complicated and it's easy to break a use case. I mean, it's trivial. I, I make a change to Zebra or the rib handling, I can ac very quickly accidentally break BGP or PBR or, or SPF. It's it's not hard. They they make assumptions about that behavior that if you change and, and no one knows it, you're gonna have to find out by an end user going, it's broken, man, and that sucks. I think it's that balance, isn't it, between discipline and inclusion. You can't have one without the other. Yeah. Um, these days, I think too many people want the, the, the cake, eat it, and then have more cake and eat it. And you, uh, you still, <laughs> life just isn't like that. And I think that's a testament to why this open source project, you know, we've sort of devolved into talking about you know open source <laughs> theories here. But I think that's one of the, the reasons that this is successful is because it has the structure, right? So many of these are necessity-driven you know, I need this tool or I need this whatever, and I'm going to write this thing and I'll put it on GitHub or GitLab or wherever, or Bitbucket, and then I'm done, right? I'm not going to document it because I wrote it for myself. And we're all, I'm guilty of this. You know, I've done it. we've all done it, right? But I think that something as complicated as this and as widely deployed as this would never succeed, even in the short term, if it did not have some kind of a governance structure around it. And I think that's that's one of the, other than the, the technical bits here, I think that's one of the key things I want to take away from this is like, there's a good structure around this and it's a solid platform um, because of that, you know, for, but not only because of that, but, but you know, that that's a contributing factor to it. But we're we're coming up on uh, we're coming up on almost an hour here, and there is so much more uh, on this list here. 
that I would love to talk about. Um, and maybe we can, Don, maybe we can get you to come back, talk about, you know, uh, PSEP and BGPLS and Yank. some wanna... of these other things that, Yank. you know, are near and dear to my heart, the Yang stuff. I think we could go deep on on a bunch of those if you'd be willing OSB, to. FB3, JSON support. Yeah, there, there's a lot of, um, at, at, a, at a future date, uh, once upon a time, I, I got into a conversation with a former Cumulus uh, CTO person about um, just the management structure of, hey, it's Linux, it's awesome. And I'm like, and you're going to throw that against 25 years of, of network auditing? So I'm super happy to see that Cumulus and, and FRR and, and everything, uh, that the whole... Uh, the whole pro all, all of those things coming together are starting to get into a more of a standardized um yeah it's not snmp but at least it's it's consistent with where the rest of the world is going right you've got at least yang models and an, from an ospf standpoint that i'm not having to scrape through regular expressions through linux comp files to be able to figure out how my ospf was which once upon a time a long time ago for for everybody listening to be clear about that uh wasn't the case so there's there's lots to dig in here sure anytime uh and i agree yang is a conversation fraught with fun <laughs> Indeed. But it's, it's been our experience that yang has been the one of the hardest things we started the yang conversion two plus years ago and we're you know we're still maybe a third or halfway in it's just it's huge yep it's a huge change, and we're trying to do it in in situ, right? I mean, we're picking up and and fixing our 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 architectural bones in place. That's uh that's fun from a programming perspective. It's, it's building the airplane while it's flying and yeah, keep it all running. Right. Don't crash. Exactly. That's what it is. It's character building. Yep. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I think On that's that as note. good a time as any. We can uh, we can we can do our. Uh, we can tell everybody where we are uh, if they want to get a hold of us. So, Don, I think you mentioned it earlier, but you know, we've if people are interested in what you're doing, they want to get a hold of you on the internet. How do they do that? Basically, come talk to me on if we're out in Slack. Um, you go that far on org, click on the Slack button, and you can get an invite. And if you want to tweet at me, I'm at me not you sharp on Twitter. Okay, Chris, where do people find you? Um, I am still at Netman Chris on Twitter, and uh, right now, funny enough, my my smart home and my networking sides are coming together. I have spent literally hours going through thread white papers. And um, <laughs> for those of you not familiar with this, this is a uh, 802.15.4, which is the old Zigbee radio system with IPv6 running over top of it, where light bulbs run a variant of RIP NG. Really? Figure that one out. Yeah, you're like, wait, rip? Like, well, yeah, we don't have the luxury of of those high powered CPUs that run CPUs that run in networking devices. Which you're on. Donald's like, wait, high powered CPU running in networking devices? Yes. <laughs> it's all relative, right? It's all relative. Yeah. Yeah, it's all relative. Well, that's interesting. Very cool stuff. Uh, David, how about you? Hey, so on Twitter, um, you can still find me at underscore IP engineer uh, and the blog, which is pretty much dusty these days, is dave.dev. How about yourself, Nick? Oh, I'm around. Uh, I've got my Twitter is at forwarding plane. I have the forwardingplane.net blog and uh, the new site for this podcast is modem.show. Uh, check that out. Uh, we should be on all of the major um podcast hosting platforms and i'm going to do my i'm going to do my my micro from dirty jobs pitch here um if you've got an idea if you have a technical problem or a technical protocol or some other interesting tidbit that you'd like to know more about that you'd like to understand the details of that you'd like us to tease apart in uh, refreshingly charming fashion. Uh, shoot us a message. Uh, hit me up on 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 Twitter. Uh, send me a direct message or whatever, and uh, we can see what we can do there. And uh, thanks for listening.
Thank you for tuning in to the Modem Podcast, where yesterday's modems are today's transponders. For more information or to request a topic, please visit modem.show.